Welcome, everyone. Good evening. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow and co-director co of the Energy and Environment Concentration here at the, uh, Center, at the School of International Public Affairs. Um, delighted to welcome um, an old friend, Johannes Erpelein, uh, back to Columbia on the occasion of the release of his new book. Congratulations on the release of your new book, um, Johannes. Uh, Johannes' new book is called Renewables, The Politics of a Global Energy Transition. Um, and Professor Erpelein is going to talk about his new book. Uh, and then I'm going to invite two distinguished experts on renewable energy up to the stage uh, to discuss it further. Um, so before bringing Johannes up, um, let me say that this event, like all events at the Center on Global Energy Policy, is being webcast live. Um, and both the full video and the podcast are going to be available in, in the coming days. If you're watching online, and we always have bigger audiences online than in the room, um, you can ask questions of the panelists anytime using the hashtag CGEP events. And please follow us on Twitter at, at Columbia U Energy. Um, so it's, it's really an honor to introduce Professor Johannes Erpelein, and he's a, a, a full time tenured faculty member at the SICE School of Advanced International Public Affairs at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. His research focuses on environmental policy, energy poverty, and international cooperation in institutions. The goal of his research is to find effective solutions to the crisis of sustainability at the global, national, and local levels. And more important than any of that, he is a non resident fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at uh, Columbia University. So, welcome, Johannes. He's going to talk for a while, and then we're going to have a conversation. Excellent. Thanks so much, David, for the kind introduction, and thanks uh, to everybody for uh, joining us uh, today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to give this talk to such a distinguished audience. So this book uh, looks at the uh, history of uh, renewable energy uh, from a policy perspective. So uh, to motivate the, the work that we uh, did, uh, I want to start with the World Energy Outlook uh, prediction from the year 2000, which says that uh, renewables are going to grow from 2% to 3% of uh, total energy consumption, with most of the uh, increase driven by the OECD countries and very little happening uh, outside the OECD. If we now look at what actually has happened uh, by the year 2017, we see a very different uh, picture. We see rapid increase uh, in the share of renewables in total uh, primary energy um, consumption and production in the world. Uh, this graph doesn't even go uh, beyond 2012, and even by then, uh, the IEA's predictions had proven wrong by a factor of uh, two. Uh, today, it would be more than this. Moreover, most of the growth has come outside the OECD. So we know that China is the biggest uh, market for renewable energy today. India is another major player. Uh, there's now a uh, growing interest in uh, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Middle East, and, and Southeast Asia. So it's really become a, a global uh, phenomenon. And what we want to do in this book then is we want to understand how did we get here? How did we go from renewables being uh, extremely expensive uh, experimental technologies uh, around 1973 to renewables being a, a major uh, corporate and uh, private sector play in 2017? Um, the story until recently is a story of industrialized countries. So here we show some renewable electricity share uh, figures for different countries. We have the United States, Germany, Denmark, uh, and the United Kingdom. And as you can see that uh, with the exception of Denmark, which has kind of driven this uh, wind energy development, uh, most of the industrialized countries got into this game uh, reasonably late. Even Germany, which has gotten a lot of uh, attention for its uh, energy wind that is you know, turned into, uh, toward renewable in a way more so from nuclear power than from coal, uh, has actually only fairly recently started to increase the, the use of, of renewable energy. So we want to understand these patterns and then also go from how do you go from a small number of pioneer countries to a truly global uh, energy phenomenon. The main uh, reasons to study this are different depending on where you come from. One obviously is climate negotiations. So if you look at the global climate policy picture, most of it is pretty depressing. We see a lot of challenges meeting uh, these targets like the two degrees Celsius target. We see many countries being off track from the new Paris Agreement targets, even though the countries were free to choose their own targets without uh, much constraint. But renewable energy is one of the more positive trends. So uh, 
the opportunity in the power sector and electrification uh, is quite significant and that's where right now the sort of more optimistic trends in this sector uh, are. Um, on the other hand, uh, renewables are also interesting because they are uh, the first sector that started to move away from what uh, researchers call carbon lock-in. So this idea of carbon lock-in is that our societies for the longest time were so dependent on a certain type of energy system. Uh, Large-scale power plants, mostly thermal, with a little bit of nuclear and large hydro thrown into the mix, that some people said that it's really hard to break out of a system like this. And renewables are sort of one of the first uh, segments of sectors that are moving away. We still have a long way to go, uh, but uh, understanding how this happened and where it's going, I think is quite important for decarbonization and low carbon growth uh, more uh, broadly. And for those of uh, us who are more academic, uh, when I was here at Columbia, I was still in the political science department. So my life was very different back then uh, from what is today in a policy school. But uh, one of the interesting things about renewables is this interplay of domestic and international factors. So we have domestic policy, but we also have international energy prices. We have global energy markets. How do these things interact and shape each other uh, is something that uh, interests me as a political scientist. And and a scholar. Okay. Um, we do have a little bit of theory here. Um, the way we argue, we went from nothing in 1973 to a global uh, market in 2017, is that it all started with these external shocks. Uh, if you think of 1973, you have the uh, Israel-Arab War uh, in October 1973, which resulted in the quadrupling of oil prices in a very short period of time. You have another similar oil shock in 1978-1979 with the Iranian uh, Revolution. You have Three Mile Island, you have Chernobyl, and later you have uh, the first evidence of climate change, uh, James Hansen's testimony in the Senate in 1988, and so on. And these were the things that gave policymakers uh, the opportunity to experiment with some new approaches. It wasn't all about let's assume six percent demand growth every year and let's build build coal-fired power plants to meet that demand that was no longer the dominant model if you look at what energy policy planning looked like in 1964 that was really the only game in town you assume that demand is just going to grow and you build enough power plants to meet the demand that's it it's very simple straightforward uh, in 1974 things looked quite different uh, because of these these shocks what happens over time, though, is that it doesn't remain in this stage of experimentation forever. At some point in different countries, renewable energy starts to gain traction, and it starts to attract a lot of attention. On the one hand, you start to have a clean technology industry that's interested in this, sees an opportunity to make money. You have the environmental groups are starting to get a hang of this. Maybe this would be a way to deal with air pollution, later climate change, and nuclear power. Um, on the other hand, you also have the opponents of renewables. Uh, some of the fossil fuel majors start realizing that this is a little worrying. We thought that solar wind are just a sideshow. We don't need to worry about it. But now it looks like we may have to do something about this. The heavy industry gets worried about these policies that increase electricity prices. And as a result, you have this process of politicization, where renewables become a political topic. In different countries, you have these political fights between the advocates and the opponents. And in some countries, the advocates win. In other countries, the opponents win. In Germany and Denmark, the advocates by 1990s, early 2000s are winning this battle, this fight. And as a result, renewable energy policy is very ambitious. So much so that many people criticize it for being much too expensive and much too uh, inefficient uh, for the country's own good. In other countries, like the United States, which initially drives some of this uh, investment in R&D, uh, in California, in the feed-in tariff, uh, the opponents win. And there is a, this kind of period of stagnation with very little investment. Over time, though, at some point, the prices come down as a result of these policies that renewables become attractive even without uh, very generous subsidies. We have subsidies still everywhere. We have tax credits, feed-in tariffs, uh, we have uh, auctions, we have all kinds of policies to support renewables, but they are not at the same level as they were in, let's say, 2003. And as a result of this, the renewable energy industry grows and it becomes a global uh, issue. It becomes a global market with lots of investments and right now there is a bit of a um, 
uh, process of uh, soul searching uh, in the industry and in government in what the next generation of policies should be. For this uh, event, I wrote a short brief uh, on what renewable energy policy should be like in the future. If you are interested, do take a look at the CGEP website and uh, take a look at a kind of a three-page summary of the future. Today you hear more from the past, and then uh, in, the, in the briefing you can see something about the future. Um, the international shocks, the external shocks that launched this, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on this, but I'll just say that really the most important early shocks were the oil crisis and nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, issues. Oil crises today are not a major... Uh, issue in renewable energy because oil prices are pretty much uh, detached from what's happening in the power sector. But that was not true in the 1970s because back then oil was still actually a major fuel uh, in power generation. So the oil crisis were a significant motivation uh, for the government and industry to start investing. And very interestingly, companies like ExxonMobil, for example, were pioneers in this space. ExxonMobil had a solar project that brought down the cost 75% uh, of solar in one year. So uh, Exxon was actually a major uh, R&D player uh, in this, this, this area. Um, there was very little political opposition, so we did these case studies, United States, Germany, other countries. These issues were simply not big enough. There were bigger considerations and concerns, nuclear power, gasoline prices, and so on. Renewables were a fairly small issue until the 1980s. And the responses to the shocks depended a lot on where the countries were. Denmark, United States, and Germany all shared something in common, which was that they were very dependent on oil and other uh, and gas uh, for their energy. Uh, France had already nuclear power, so much so that there wasn't really anything to worry about. It wasn't a big deal for France. The United Kingdom had just found these huge oil and gas deposits in the North Sea, so they were also, well, what's there to worry? Um, we have plenty of, of uh, these resources. Finland, my home country, had uh, negotiated these long-term contracts with the Soviet Union to bring in natural gas. We were one of the few countries that actually had extensive trade uh, with the Soviet Union. They didn't produce anything worth buying except natural gas and oil, so we bought all the natural gas and oil we could use, and then we sold them whatever else they uh, wanted. So that was a pretty good deal for us uh, back then. But because of this and our nuclear power investments, we were also uh, not interested. So you see this early divergence between these so-called pioneer countries and then everybody else. What happens over time is you start to have this politicization. And, and really this becomes a, a major conflict uh, between the opponents and the proponents of, of renewables. Once the opponents start to see that there is possibly uh, some changes in the horizon, on the horizon. This is really not just an experimental policy anymore, but it could change the way we sell and use energy that's when these things become political. And once you throw climate change into the mix, it becomes even more so. In the United States, for example, the early renewable energy debates in the 80s were more related to things like small government, big government, fiscal conservatives, all that. It was only the 1990s with climate change that you started to see this sort of large-scale uh, opposition to renewable energy as part of the climate uh, agenda. Denmark, Germany, very different outcomes. Quite Clearly, over time, the advocates of renewable energy won these different battles. In, in Germany, it's a combination of the Green Party. Germany has the most successful Green Party in Europe, uh, the clean technology industry, um, and things like decreasing domestic uh, uh, coal production, and so on. In Denmark, on the other hand, it had a lot to do with nuclear power, plus the success of the wind industry. Vestas was the original pioneer in the wind industry. And when you put together a kind of a powerful industry coalition with uh, some environmentalism and concerns about nuclear power, renewables are kind of a natural uh, investment. And that's how Denmark and Germany, the renewable side, wins these political battles. In the United States, the opponents win, as, and as a result, there is little investment in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. I'm going to skip this one. I've kind of gone through already. Um, over time, though, we move into the most interesting phase, which is what we would call this new lock-in of renewables. Policies bring down costs. We know from basic energy economics that the more scale you have, the more opportunities you have, how to do things better, how to reduce the cost, there's more competition, more companies are entering the game. Um, and as a result, the costs come down over time. Until at some point, they become so low 
that renewables actually become a good business proposition. Not necessarily, again, in my hometown in northern Finland, good luck with solar uh, business in, in, in that environment. But if you go to uh, Western India, Rajasthan, for example, 300 days sunshine, early morning, late night, it's a good way to make money there. And as a result of this, uh, a lot of countries are starting to show interest in renewables, and it all happens fairly soon. In 2002, very little interest anywhere. By 2010, uh, dozens of countries, uh, and by now I would say more than 100 countries, are actively uh, looking for renewable energy uh, opportunities. We look at the uh, case studies, we of course look at Portugal and Spain, which were some of the sort of early and more aggressive movers uh, in this space. We look at China, India, Brazil, because of the scale. These countries are so important uh, for the global renewable energy market. We also look at some of the more recent uh, players like Kenya, and Thailand, and, and everywhere a combination of energy security, climate change, and most importantly, uh, electricity demand is driving investment uh, in renewables. This is not to say that policy is, has become irrelevant. Uh, policies play a major role, and in fact, one of the drivers of this lower cost in recent years has been auctions, where these governments force these companies to aggressively compete with each other, and that has brought down the bids uh, in Chile, Mexico, India, South Africa, uh, everywhere we see lower and lower uh, prices. Let's get this few skips. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about China and India before I conclude. Uh, those are two countries that should be uh, of interest to everybody. So in China, renewables are 25% of the electricity generation capacity as of 2016. Now, probably a little more. Uh, the investments are quite uh, uh, impressive. Nonetheless, uh, large hydro remains the most important uh, play. Uh, at the same time, wind alone by 2016 generated more electricity than nuclear power. And China doesn't have a trivial nuclear power program. They actually build nuclear power plants. So it's quite interesting how China has gotten to the point where they've made fairly aggressive investments. Uh, they've gone sort of ahead of nuclear power, but still have a long way to go to any kind of a decarbonized, or low carbon uh, electric system. They're also the world's leading manufacturer. So China has not only played a major role as a consumer of renewable energy, but maybe more importantly, as the country that made solar panels cheap for everybody, with these very aggressive subsidies and a scale-up uh, of the industries. China faces its own challenges, so uh, technical performance of renewable energy installations in China still remains below OECD countries. It's improving, but it's still not there compared to, for example, the United States or Europe. So there is some way to go there. Intermittency a major issue. The Chinese electricity market isn't exactly a kind of a smooth system where everything is optimal and so on. There's still a lot of curtailment of renewable energy. So the Chinese government has its work uh, cut uh, for itself in the coming years. Um, and I do think uh, I see encouraging signs where this sort of rapid expansion uh, phase is over and there's now more interest in containing costs, ensuring quality, and making sure that this transition into a kind of a truly renewable space system is, is starting to happen. And on the production side also, I think the Chinese producers have become much more competitive and less dependent uh, on the subsidies. So the outlook in many ways is quite bright, but a lot of challenge remains. Very interesting comparison is India. This is the country where I do most of my work. Um, in India, uh, in 2014, about 16% of electricity generation capacity was in renewables. Again, today it's a little more than this because the investments are quite aggressive. Interestingly, um, solar and wind were 5% in 2014. So as a percentage, India was actually ahead of China. But that's only because India's electricity demand is so much less than China's. It's something like one-fourth, one-fifth of uh, China's per capita basis, and the populations are about the same size. This in turn reflects lower GDP per capita and equally important, less industrialization. India is one of those funny countries where economic growth comes from the service sector before uh, the industrial sector, which is not happening in many places around the world. India has a, an aggressive target of 175 gigawatts of renewable power by 2022. 20, uh, looks like they are making it. Uh, 
the country is roughly on track, though right now they are starting to face some challenges because the investments have been so aggressive and uh, generous that there's a bit of a fatigue in the industry and people are starting to get uh, worried about how are we actually going to uh, honor our commitments in these power purchase agreements. I've also heard some people in the sector say that they're now looking at uh, uh, such cost reductions in the future that they are hesitating to interest because if they interest 10 years later, it will be more profitable. And if everybody does that, there's no investment and there's no cost reduction. So there is this bit of a holdup problem uh, in the Indian sector. India certainly faces uh, challenges. Financing is the biggest one. So if you look at Indian economy in general, interest rates are very high. So it's considered a kind of a high risk economy for any kind of investment and renewable energy is stands out as one of the sort of more uh, risky sectors for investment, according to the people who set the interest rates, uh, which I think is a good kind of a group of people to believe. Um, so it seems that in the financial industry, there is still this perception that renewables face many challenges and risks in India in the future. So a lot of the reason why we don't see, uh, for example, as low cost as we would see in the Middle East is that the financial risks are significant. Intermittency is another major issue. So India already has, has gigawatts of capacity that's been curtailed, where because of poor planning, lack of demand, you have wind turbines spinning, but nothing is happening, they are not connected to the grid, or you have solar panels not doing anything, they are connected to the grid, but there is no demand. Uh, there was a very optimistic report uh, that came out from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and some Indian regulators last year, which said everything's great, uh, things are going to move forward. That's nice, but one of the assumptions they made is that everything is optimal and perfectly planned. If you go and look at how planning is happening in India's very complicated, politicized federal system, it's probably not going to be optimal and perfect. So there's a lot of political economy uh, risk around this. And more recently, the Modi government is looking at ways to raise more revenue. Some of the ideas are, why don't we tax renewable energy products? And why don't we impose some more import duties uh, to reduce Chinese imports and to promote domestic manufacturing? I think that's a terrible idea, but uh, I don't think the Modi government pays a lot of attention to what I say. So these are additional risks at the macro level uh, for the country. So let me conclude here and let's get to the, the conversation with our distinguished uh, panel. So what we've done is really we've looked at the political history of renewable energy. We look at the same perspective that an engineer or energy planner would take, but we focus on what are the policies, where do they come from, how did they become topics of political controversy, and what were the outcomes of that process. We hope that uh, by doing this, we have a better understanding of how the sustainable energy transitions might happen. And right now, I'm very interested uh, and actively following, for example, battery storage. Do we see similar dynamics there? Uh, what about electric vehicles? Can we apply some of these ideas? Or are these sectors so different that our ideas are outdated uh, by now? That would be a shame, right? Uh, and finally, we do hope that having this kind of uh, long understanding of what's happening in history can also improve national policy and promote international cooperation in these issues. One of the encouraging signs that we've seen in this sector is this move away from the feed-in tariffs, which were an excellent policy when you had basically nothing to start with. And the goal was just to get somebody to put some money into this, into auctions which are focused on cost minimization. My thinking is that the next generation really needs to focus on intermittency and challenges to grid penetration and integration of renewables. So uh, I hope that in the future we see another uh, kind of wave of innovation, both technological and policy, that would allow us to uh, bring renewables from 20% of renewable uh, of electricity generation to 60%, 70 and maybe more. With that, I thank you all for your attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Johannes. That was a tremendous presentation. Um, for those of you who are listening on podcast, my name is David Sandalow. I'm the inaugural fellow at the SEPA Center on Global Energy Policy. You were just listening to Professor Johannes Erpelainen of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies um, uh, talking about his new book on uh, renewables, the politics of a... Uh, what, is it? what is the title, Johannes? The full title? Politics of uh, Global Energy Transition. It's available on Amazon.com, right? That's right. Available on Amazon.com. Um, and, and we're really delighted to be joined by two very distinguished experts on renewable energy for our conversation. Sitting immediately to my left 
is Colleen Reagan, who's the head of North American Power and Environmental Markets at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, Colleen directs the team's cross-sectoral power research, including utility strategy, strategy, power plant economics, and carbon and renewable electricity certificate markets. Um, she's worked previously at the OECD and at Credit Suisse, has degrees from Georgetown and from Johns Hopkins um, as well. Um, to Colleen's left is Shale Khan, who is uh, Senior Vice President of Research and Strategy at Energy Impact Partners. Previously, he was Senior Vice President at Green Tech Media and Head of GTM Research, where he built and led a team of 25 analysts. He's widely, uh, he speaks and writes widely. He's published in many outlets um, uh, and um, was a Fulbright Scholar and graduate of Pomona College and is a non-resident fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia University. Um, let me start, Colleen, by asking you, just generally, having listened to this presentation, any, any points you particularly agree or disagree with from what you just heard? Thanks, David, and, and thanks for having me here. Although we already had one SICE representative, I appreciate that we, that I got invited even though I'm also a SICER. Um, I thought that was an excellent presentation, and I, I very much agree with the points that uh, Johannes raised. Um, in particular, I'd like to note that that his last point on, on auctions and the, the, um, the transition away from feed-in tariffs as a way of subsidizing and promoting renewable energy and a shift towards auctions, which we've seen globally. Um, Europe moved initially to have feed-in tariffs to support wind and solar in, in many of their countries, and it was exceedingly expensive. And for those who have looked at the area, you can see that there were retroactive policy uh, changes cuts to those feed-in tariffs, which were uh, not, not great for the sector. But we've seen in the developing countries that they've learned from these lessons of Europe, and they're going for auctions as a way to spur uh, the rollout of wind and solar. And, and it's been really amazing in terms of what they've been able to achieve, because they're encouraging competition amongst uh, developers. So for example, just a couple years ago, um, Enel, which is a very large Italian utility, won a wind auction in Mexico for about $35 a megawatt hour. And at the time, everybody said, oh my god, that is insanely cheap. They'll never be able to do it. There's no way that they could possibly build a wind farm for that price. And it's getting built. And that price has now been beaten by a wind auction in Chile for only about $18 a megawatt hour. So these auctions have, have been hugely successful in terms of their ability to encourage competition, to drive down costs, and unfortunately for some developers also margins. Um, but they've gone a long way into really promoting uh, the industry and also lowering, lowering costs for, for everyone involved. So I think that's something that we've highlighted in our work at BNF and we think is really good for the sector. Well, thanks. Let's, let's come back to auctions in a minute. I just want to pose the same general question to Shale. Any, anything you heard in that presentation you particularly agree or disagree with that you wanted to note? And the yeah, and thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I also agree, and I thought it was a great uh, summary of how we got to where we are today in renewable energy globally. I guess I would have a few things to add on to it that I think are worth noting. Um, the first is in the context of the history, especially for solar, I think, we, you didn't mention Japan. Japan was an important market. It had a, a feed-in tariff, an early feed-in tariff, pre-Germany, actually, for residential solar. Uh, so both from a technology development perspective, companies like Sharp were early solar panel manufacturers, and from a deployment perspective, the residential solar business globally was built in Japan before it was built in Germany. So th that, I think, is interesting. The second point, further to Colleen's point, um, you know, the shift to auctions has been spurred in part by the fact that feed-in tariffs were, depending on how you look at it, either very successful in building the renewable energy market or set some countries back, right? So Germany is an example, probably, of where you can make the case in either direction. It's hard to make the case that feed-in tariffs were a successful policy in the case of, say, Spain or the Czech Republic. Spain is the example that Colleen mentioned, which is a country that for a year in 2008 was the largest solar market in the world, thanks to a really generous feed-in tariff program. They slashed the feed-in tariff a year later. They had basically zero solar installations. Not only have they not really recovered from that, but since then, because of a fiscal crisis in the country, they've tried to retroactively cut feed-in tariff payments that were supposed to be 20-year contracts. So that has set the market back in a way that it hasn't come back from in a decade. Czech Republic, uh, 
Less drastic example, but small market that all of a sudden popped up as the second largest solar market for a year, in this case was 2010, I think, uh, similarly never came back from the, you know, never recovered from the backlash that occurred after setting too generous a policy. The final thing that I guess I would note um, is related to the U.S., and I think in the context of the U.S., the, the thing that about the U.S. that made it uh, successful in the context of renewables was the states, right? We've had federal policy in the U.S. that has been somewhat stagnant. We've had tax credits for wind and solar for a long time, and they get extended, and for a brief period of time, they were refundable tax credits when we, there was no tax equity available during the financial crisis. But really, what has built the renewable energy industry has been the role of states, in particular states setting renewable portfolio standards. So the way, until very recently, just the past couple of years, the way that any large centralized wind or solar project got built in the United States was by stacking two incentives. You had the federal incentive in the form of an investment tax credit or a production tax credit, and then you had a state incentive in the form of generally a state mandate to procure a certain amount of renewables as a share of overall generation. Were it not for that second layer of the cake, we would not have a renewable energy market in the United States. So from a policy perspective, it's due largely to the 30-some states that have imposed those types of policies that we have the market that we do today. Johannes, I have one question about your presentation or, or a comment about it. I, mean, I thought it was a tremendous presentation overall. I wasn't exactly sure what you meant by opposition to renewable energy. Um, and may I just elaborate on that? And particularly in the United States, there aren't that many topics in our polarized nation that get really high um, support across the political spectrum. But in my experience, renewable energy tends to be one of them. There was a famous experience in presidential campaign in 2012. Um, uh, Mitt Romney, who was running for president, came out against a uh, extension of a federal tax credit for wind, and the Republican delegation in Iowa and uh, Congress and the Republican governor criticized him for that and said, oh, no, we're not. You know, we, we support this. So when you think about opposition to renewable energy, particularly in the U.S., what, what did you have in mind? Okay, so here uh, I see that maybe I should not have skipped all my slides because I had a kind of a, two, a slide that makes the point. So if you look at the votes in the Congress on renewable energy in the 1970s, they're very bipartisan. So both parties have roughly the same outlook. Should we do this? Should we not? Um, if you then look at the votes in the 80s and the 90s, the Democrats are fully in line with support renewables, and the Republicans are 100% against. It's a, it's a big difference uh, in how these votes go. If we now look at the past five years, um, it has again started to change, past five, 10 years. In fact, one of the really interesting things looking at the current administration's policies, one of the things that hasn't received a lot of attention is the production tax credit. We don't hear Trump you know, uh, railing about the production tax credit. And that goes to David's point is that now, at this point, many of these renewable energy installations are actually in very important Republican di districts. So any politician on the Republican side who uh, starts to uh, challenge the production tax credit or other renewable energy policies is really looking for trouble. And as a result, it has actually become one of the issues that is not polarizing the two parties. So they don't talk about it in terms of, yes, we agree, they just don't talk about it. And they keep it kind of a, on a low level, yeah. Maybe we could do just kind of a tour of the world and then before touching on some specific topics. And since Johannes has talked about the United States, I wonder from either Colleen or Shale, kind of any, any thoughts up first about federal government policy for renewables right now, what the Trump administration is doing, how much of an impact does this have on the market in the United States? Obviously, he's much less supportive in general of this effort than, than the Obama administration had been, but how, how much of an issue do you think that is for the market in the U.S.? Well, I'll start by just noting that I don't, I'm not confident that Trump knows what the production tax credit is. <laughs> um, he, he famously said during the campaign that wind kills birds, and so therefore he didn't really like that. Um, at the moment, I, I agree with Shale that I really think what's, what's important for the renewable energy industry is, is what's happening on a state level. Uh, if you ask the AWEA, which is the Association of Wind Energy in America, They'll be very quick to point out that the majority of wind, um, wind farms and also wind manufacturing facilities are in red states. Uh, so there is certainly interest in red states in continuing the growth of that industry. 
but state renewable portfolio standards, state greenhouse gas emissions targets, um, but mostly renewable portfolio standards continue to be very important for the, for the growth of the sector. Um, I think what the Trump administration is more likely to do is maybe slightly harm the growth of the sector in the near term, but I don't think it can derail it in the longer term. So the solar tariffs are an obvious example. We think they'll probably, um, you know, they in, in the short term increase the cost of installing a utility scale solar uh, farm by about 10 percent. Uh, for residential consumers, it's about a 4 percent increase in the first year. So that will have uh, a small, um, not a huge impact, but a small impact on the deployment of solar in the next four years. We think about a 5 percent cut overall. Um, we'll see some projects that are on the margin being canceled. We'll see other projects perhaps being delayed until the tariffs roll off in five years. So um, I guess my, my summary would be Trump not going to do huge things for the sector, but he's not going to destroy it either. Shale, you wrote a really thoughtful piece about the solar tariffs, which is up on the website of the Center on Global Energy Policy. Do you, do you agree with Colleen's assessment here? On the tariffs specifically? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, those numbers are right. The tariffs have, a, have a, a small but meaningful impact. They have a bigger impact on utility scale projects than they do on commercial, than they do on residential. So if you're thinking about impact on the market, it will be largest on the, the largest projects and smallest on the smallest projects. But on any of those sectors, it's, it's incremental in the grander scheme of things. You know, we've estimated something like a 12% net impact on utility scale installations over the next four years. It's not killing the market. Importantly, also, there are a lot of projects that are getting installed that are not subject to the tariffs for a number of different reasons. You've got some domestic manufacturing already. You've got a carve out to be able to import up to two and a half gigawatts of cells into the US. So there's some additional imports that will not be taxed or tariffed rather. And then a lot of uh, developers, especially the bigger ones, who are preparing for tariffs bought excess inventory early, and so they're installing projects off of that. So these tariffs have a four-year shelf life that steps down every year. Um, historically, despite them initially having a four-year shelf life, tariffs of this type have averaged about two and a half years because almost every time, and this is definitely true this time, other countries submit complaints to the WTO about import tariffs like this called safeguard tariffs. The U.S. has never won at the WTO in one of those debates because the ty these types of tariffs are not legal under WTO rules. So the U.S. will lose that debate. Historically, that has then led the president to sunset tariffs early in most cases, especially since 1992. That will be an interesting moment in time in this administration because it's going to set up a fight in front of the WTO with the Trump administration wherein you know, the president could do any number of things. Even in the worst case scenario where the tariffs stay for the full four years, it's an incremental impact on the market. How much incremental manufacturing do you see happening in the U.S. as a result of these tariffs? Virtually zero. Um, that is important, right? The, the, the ostensible reason, you set me up for that, that was a layup. Um, <laughs> the ostensible reason to impose import tariffs on solar panels in the U.S. is to support domestic manufacturing of solar. These tariffs do not do that. They won't do that for a couple of reasons. One, as I said before, there are enough projects that are not going to be subject to these tariffs that there isn't that much demand for domestically manufactured product. Second, the domestically manufactured product is significantly more expensive than what you can buy from largely Southeast Asia now. You would think it's China. These days we import mostly from Southeast Asia to a lesser extent from Mexico. So you're spending more to manufacture it. That it can overcome to a large extent the cost impact of the tariffs themselves. That will be increasingly true over time because as I said, the tariffs step down every year. They go from 20% to 15% to 10% before they go down to zero. And it takes you 18 months to set up a domestic manufacturing facility. So even if you had decided on the moment that the tariffs were imposed in the United States, that you were gonna set up a new big manufacturing facility for solar panels in the United States, you would have that thing operational in 2019 in all likelihood, by which point the tariffs are already sunsetting and you have now spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a facility that is supposed to operate for 20 years competitively. Almost nobody is going to do it. You're going to have one or two exceptions. There's one company that's going to set up a small manufacturing facility in, in Florida for just module assembly. I find it very unlikely you'll see much more than that. So the net impact of this is not going to be a boom in new domestic jobs for solar manufacturing. It's just going to be a slight reduction in the jobs you have in the installation business.
Let's go to some other places in the world that are important for renewable energy, starting with China, which leads the world in renewable energy deployment. Um, last year, 50 gigawatts of solar deployed in, in China, with five times that in the United States, half the world total. I don't, Colleen, you want to lead, lead off, or, or Johannes, anybody no, want? Johannes, take that. Okay, Johannes, um, any, any, you talked some about this in your remarks, but you want to elaborate on what's happening in, in China? So um, I think, um, the, like you said, David, the, the numbers are mind-boggling. Uh, the, the investments are absolutely massive, and uh, the, the, the sector is, is growing very fast. And uh, the, the opportunity for decarbonization and achieving some of these goals is quite significant. My um, concern here, and here I have to say I'm not probably entirely up to speed uh, what's happening is really, is there a good policy framework or a plan for dealing with the issues that you face when you start to go uh, into very significant uh, penetration rates. So typically what we've seen in different countries is that as long as you remain in the 10 to 15 percent rate, it kind of, the system just deals with it and we don't really see these major intermittency problems. But if the goal at some point is to reach 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or something like that, then you start to see more serious issues. One of the reasons why we haven't seen it in these early leaders like Denmark is that, well, the Danish can just always send it to Norway and then buy it back uh, at some other time because there's unlimited uh, uh, pumping uh, storage capacity there. Similarly, Germany is part of the European market. Uh, Germany has faced more serious issues. When we see negative electricity prices, that's always a little scary because it means you're producing something that is not just, you know, uh, of no interest to anybody, it's in fact so bad that you have to pay people to take it. And this despite being in the middle of a, a supposedly integrated uh, regional system. So I think the biggest question for the Chinese is that is there a kind of a, a long-term action plan for dealing with these kind of issues, whether it's storage or improving trade or smart grids or all these things. And I just don't know what the answer to that question is. You, David, might actually have a better sense of how this, this works. Yeah, I'm actually just back from 11 days in Beijing, and, and the curtailment issue is a big issue in China right now. Kind of interestingly, China deployed more solar panels last year than the United States did, but the United States generated more solar power because a lot of the solar panels in China are not actually generating electricity because of a number of problems. They're not, either not physically connected to the grid or coal plants have priority in the dispatch of electricity. So it's, that, that's a big challenge. Um, we could come back to a tour of the world, but I think, Johannes, you just raised a really fundamental issue for renewables, which maybe we should talk about, which is integration into electric grids as deployment gets bigger and bigger. I don't know, either, either Shale or Colleen, do you want to talk about that? I mean, as, as renewable, variable renewables, solar and wind, reach the levels Johannes was talking about, 40, 50, 60 percent, uh, how much of a problem is that in the management of electric grids and what needs to be done to address that? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so I think that, I think it's important to separate out, I think people conflate two separate issues. There's the issue with the reliability of the grid, which actually turns out to be far less of an issue than one might think, even at those relatively high penetrations. We have lots of grids that are at more than 40, 50, 60 percent penetration of renewable energy, for which they, the reliability is not an issue. The issue is economic, for the most part, right? Can we get to that point without paying way too much money for electricity because wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine and we have to back it up with something. So does that mean we're going to spend too much or does that mean we're going to be burning a bunch of coal and if we have greenhouse gas targets then, then we have another problem. On the latter point of the economic part of it, you know, I think the, the way to think about what you need, I think it's right, and that once you're in the up to the 10-15% penetration of renewables mark you don't have much to worry about. You get to 10 to say 30%, you're start gonna start to have some curtailment, for example. California is at 30% renewable energy right now, and in the spring, we actually do curtail a fair amount of solar, because we have too much solar generation, over generation, some inflexible generation that can't turn off. Um, but it's not enough to, to make the economics of the system too bad yet. But as you get to 40, 50, 60%, you start to run into those issues. And then your solution is this basket of flexibility resources. Right. And so that can be anything from changing load patterns to better align with the generation profile of renewables. It can be adding a lot of electric vehicles to the grid with smart charging. It can be high voltage DC transmission that ships power from where it needs to be to where it is generated. And it can be battery storage of various kinds. 
So you have a, a basket of flexibility solutions, and I think the, the markets that are doing well at this, and Colleen can speak to specific markets that are doing well at it, uh, they are considering those solutions as one holistic group and saying, okay, what we need on this grid is flexibility. Let's incentivize that and then figure out what resources are gonna provide it that are best suited for our location. I did wanna add one point on, on the economics in California. Um, while I agree that overall the system economics are not, um, are not an issue right now in California, I, I live in San Francisco, I certainly don't feel like I'm, I'm concerned about my electricity bills, it's not a problem, but it is a problem for individual generators in the market. So the fact that there is so much solar, this was a really bad April, for example, um, and in particular, last year was a really bad April too for gas generators. So the fact that there was so much solar that was generating in the middle of the day, there was also, in last April, we had so much snow in California. The spring melt meant that hydro plants were running at insane capacity factors, which meant that there was really no need for natural gas plants, except in the evening. So they had an issue where they were first forced to turn off in the middle of the day, which increases their operations and maintenance costs. And to the extent that they couldn't turn off in the middle of the day, sometimes they couldn't, they were forced to accept negative pricing. And so you had an, an issue in 2017 where most gas plants uh, that were very much needed for 8 p.m. when the sun goes down were operating at a loss. And they're all saying to the California ISO, we can't run like this anymore. We're going to need to shut down. And the CPUC is totally fine with that. The CPUC does not really want a lot of gas in the California grid. They're going out now to utilities and saying, we'd like you to cancel this reliability contract you have with this gas plant because we'd, we'd prefer that you think about storage. And well, I certainly understand where they're coming from. Eventually we need um, you know, to think about storage. We need storage costs to come down. We're not, the costs are, are not there yet. And there needs to be some sort of short-term to medium-term solution to help these gas plants stay online because California still needs them. And they are really not getting the money that they need on the market. So even at these 30% renewable penetration levels in California, it's enough to really hurt the economics of, of plants that are, are needed at times when renewables are not present. Would that be a capacity auction mechanism or something like that? Or, or California does have a, a strange capacity mechanism which is called resource adequacy. Rather than a centrally procured program that they have in other areas of the country such as um, New York, New England, uh, PJM which is the mid-Atlantic region, uh, capacity is procured through uh, bilateral contracts by the utilities. Um, and, and essentially the gas generators are relying more and more on these resource adequacy payments, but even then they're saying that's not enough um, to make up for the fact that we are now basically making negative money in the energy markets. So then the utilities have to go back to the regulators to get approval for higher resource adequacy payments? Is well, that, that's to, the challenge? They have to renegotiate those contracts yeah. to the extent that they can, but the utilities at the same time don't want to do that because, and I, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but in California, uh, like Germany, like Spain, they have a bit of a first mover disadvantage in the, the utilities signed an awful lot of wind and solar contracts in the $150 to $200 per megawatt hour range. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you're seeing wind now being built for $20 to $30. You're even seeing $30 to $40 solar in the United States. So they don't want to pay any more to these gas generators when they're already paying so much to these solar and uh, particularly solar, but also some wind farms that were constructed in the 2010 timeframe. What do any of you foresee for the future of storage and what you mentioned storage costs coming down? How, how low do they have to come, the costs come in order to be able to balance the grid in this type of setting? And how, how long are we talking about? Is that a year away, 10 years away? What do you think? Shell, you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Well, I mean, I can give you a, a California specific example, um, which is there's a, there's a gas plant uh, planned. In, in, so actually, let me step back. Storage can do a bunch of different things, right? People call it the Swiss Army knife of the grid or the bacon of the grid or, you know, pick your, pick your stretched metaphor. So, you know, energy storage can serve a lot of purposes. It can, it can act really fast um, and it can provide, you know, immediate spinning reserves. It can act... 
for multiple hours and shift power from the daytime when solar is generating into the evening. At some point, we may have batteries that can shift seasonal loads as well, but we're not quite there yet. I think what we're talking about right now, for the most part, is this sort of four-hour duration, like deal with the, inter the daily diurnal intermittency of, of renewables thing. So there was a gas plant planned, and it's called the Puente Power Plant. NRG had planned this 260 megawatt uh, peaker plant in California, and in Oxnard. And it was, it was up for final approval from the California Energy Commission. Uh, and it had all sorts of local environmental opposition for various reasons, but was considered to be needed. It, had a, it was needed from a reliab local reliability perspective. And the California Energy Commission had commissioned a study um, saying, well, what if we did preferred resources instead. And preferred resources in California means renewables and energy storage and anything but fossil fuels. So they commissioned the study. The study found that the storage, for the most part, would be the solution to that, but that it was too expensive um, by a fair margin. And so they were about to approve this plant. And suddenly, a bunch of people popped up and looked at that study and said, wait a minute, that study is using energy storage cost data from 2014, which in the context of energy storage today is like eons ago. So the California Energy Com so we, we looked at the numbers, and basically energy storage to compete in that case would have to be fully installed for, I think it was $450 a kilowatt hour, which is lower than today's costs. but. The CEC went out and said, you know, had some conversations with energy storage developers and said, could you get to that number by early next decade? And they said, yeah, probably. So now they're putting it out to bid again. Um, and they may or may not get something that competes directly. But, you know, the challenge that you face if you're a regulator, if you're, if you're a utility, is you, you have a pretty good sense of the cost of your resources today. It's very hard to predict exactly how cheap, especially energy storage, is going to get five years from now. So you can either bank on it, you know, you can bank on the cost curve falling, which would have been the right thing to do in the case of solar, for example, and maybe the right thing to do in the case of storage. Um, but you, you can't run big risks. So it may still make sense to keep gas plants online, even if energy storage could come in in five years and compete, because you can't run that risk. I love that we're talking about California, but we're sitting right here in New York, and so I, New York has some very innovative regulatory programs in this area. I wonder if anyone has any thoughts or comments about the REV program and renewables and how those issues relate to each other. Any? You go first. I don't actually know that much about REV, to be oh. honest. I could talk a little bit about REV. Uh, so REV is the Reforming the Energy Vision. It is New York's uh, big, iconic, regulatory initiative to reinvent the electricity market in the state to create a vibrant distributed energy marketplace wherein all of us who have solar on our roofs and batteries in our houses and electric vehicles and, can, and programmable thermostats and all these kinds of things that we can participate directly in the market. And our resources um, should be appropriately valued according to where we sit on the grid and the time at which they are operating. Uh, we should all benefit as customers and Notably, the utilities also should transform their business models such that this is good for them too. They, they become platform businesses. Um, Rev is, was a, is, is and was a fantastic idea on paper, uh, has proven to be extremely difficult to implement. And so we're now a few years into it and everybody's still very engaged in it. It's still an ongoing process, but I think there is some frustration amongst the participants that it is taking is going a lot slower than was expected and that we are spinning our wheels a bit and actually getting it done. So there are pilot projects underway and bits of it are happening, but but you know, it it's a, a good example of a challenge where if you you know, New York tried to reinvent the electricity sector, especially the distributed electricity sector, basically all at once. And they tried to do it in a pretty rapid time horizon. That's really hard. Um, there's a case to be made given that lesson that the right way to do it is incrementally, um, piece by piece, which I think is actually a little closer to what California is doing. And New York does have some very ambitious renewables goals. 50% renewable deployment by 2030 um, is the governor's goal. And, and he now has the most ambitious energy storage goal in the country, which is 1.5 gigawatts by 2025 is, is the statewide goal here. 
Um, Though California is going to exceed that. Not to be, I live in San Francisco as well, so I don't mean to be rivalrous here, but uh, California has a 1.2 right. gigawatt goal. They're going to blow past it well before New York hits its 1.5. Oh, this is a good competition to get going here. Let's yeah. see. Uh -huh. um, Johanna, you mentioned in your remarks that you spent time in India, and I know for, um, you're really quite expert in that. Could you just elaborate on what's happening in the Indian market on renewables, because it's, it's such an important country for renewable energy? So uh, India's renewable energy market really has three main components, um, one of which is doing very well, one of which is starting to grow, and one of which is struggling. So, so the part that is doing well is this really this grid scale, utility scale, uh, large in installments, both of wind and solar. So both of those have grown very fast. Uh, the scale is not quite uh, as uh, impressive as in China, but again, if you adjust for the overall size of the system, it's approximately in the same ballpark. So if uh, China in, uh, builds 50 gigawatts and India builds uh, 15 to 20, then that's a kind of a comparable uh, achievement. Uh, so that on that scale, India is doing very well. The costs have come down. They are on track to achieving their, their goals. Um, and for example, in this last uh, quarter of 2017, India didn't bring in any new thermal power. Uh, there were some retirements, uh, and almost everything that they built was either solar uh, or wind. So that market is doing well. The challenge, again, is once these systemic issues start to uh, appear, whenever you look at this market and you discuss the cost, it's always just a generation cost in the bid in the auction. There is no discussion of what's happening in the system more broadly. Uh, so that's the uncertainty in this area. The second market which is starting to grow now finally is rooftop uh, solar. And a lot of this is actually industrial. India is one of those countries where electricity prices are higher for industrial users than for residential. So this means that if there is one constituency that is really interested in uh, having their own solar panels, it's factories uh, that run some kind of machinery and appliances that then use a lot of energy. So one of the interesting things here is that this could actually be a real problem for the Indian power sector because those are the consumers that currently pay the bills. Everybody else gets very heavily subsidized electricity. So if the industrial consumers start, start to kind of exit from the grid system, that could be a real problem uh, in the future. I haven't seen any comprehensive analysis of this, but just looking at how much this is happening in places like Tamil Nadu right now, uh, it is a potential threat in the future. The segment of the India market that has been a disappointment is distributed energy. So thinking of uh, these village scale microgrids, mini grids, home systems, that market hasn't grown the way people expected uh, it would grow. And one of the big reasons for this is that India has this very aggressive grid extension program uh, that is ongoing. The, uh, the Prime Minister Modi right now has this new scheme called Sobhagya, or uh, in uh, English, Good Fortune, which aims to electrify all the households. Uh, the formal goal is in one year, but that's of course not going to happen. Uh, I would not be surprised if in the next four to five years, India would be somewhere at 90% uh, electrification rate. That's a pretty impressive uh, achievement. What that means for the distributed sector is that there's a lot of uncertainty. You go into a village, you have no idea three months from now how many people are there. We've seen villages that five years ago had 0% electrification rate and today are at 100%. Many of my projects are in trouble because of this rapid pace. I have to uh, spend way too much time on 4 a.m. phone calls trying to figure out how to deal with this rapidly changing uh, uh, scenario. But the distributed sector, I think, is, is currently struggling and the future for that sector has to be more as a kind of a backup a reliability solution rather than as a primary solution. There's just, it's really hard to make the case, uh, for example, for a mini grid in the Indian context if the grid is already there. The grid electricity is just fundamentally cheaper because you don't need to build unnecessary batteries, solar panels, all that. It's also subsidized and just by being there, it makes consumers less interested in mini grids and micro grids because there's always the other alternative. So I think the distributed sector is going to face some challenges in the, uh, for years to come. For those listening on podcasts, that was Professor Johannes Erpelainen, who he was talking about his new book, Renewables, The Politics of a Global Energy Transition, which is available on Amazon.com. Um, my name is David Sandelow. Um, let me just, in a moment, we're going to go to the audience because uh, we've got a lot of expertise. I see some 
people in the audience who know a lot about these topics. Um, but Colleen, um, I just wanted to ask you generally about financing for renewable energy at, at this point. There, there historically has been real challenges for this sector in raising money from the capital markets. Um, uh, diffi difficulty getting debt financing, those, those types of issues. How much of an issue do you think that is today? Is, is it a challenge um, to, to raise money for renewable energy projects in the United States and around the world at this point? Um, yes and no. It, it certainly depends, obviously, on how on, on the company itself. So while the, the industry is certainly growing, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can make a good bet on an individual company and they'll still be around in a few years. And that's particularly the case in the storage sector, where you know, we might be very confident that lithium-ion batteries are a growing segment and increasingly important in the energy sector, but that doesn't mean that you're going to feel very confident about any particular energy storage company. Um, and EVs, too. So Tesla, for example, um, they're burning through a, a heck of a lot of cash. Um, and there might be many in the, in the sector that would argue that they might not be a going concern for, for much longer. So there, um, individual companies may sometimes struggle, but I do think the outlook for the sector as a whole is, is very positive. Um, we did see, for example, uh, investment or money capital raised for the, the public markets for uh, solar companies definitely took a downturn after the uh, bankruptcy of Sun Edison, but that has that has rebounded somewhat, um, and that's about all I have there. So. Shale, any thoughts to add? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think I'd, I'd just distinguish between corporate capital and project capital. I think project capital is not that hard to come by. If you have a good project, the money's there now, and that's that's basically true globally. Um, it's definitely true in the United States, and it's, it's true of most of the world. Um, corporate capital, as Colleen said, depending on the company, can be a lot harder to achieve, and we still have a challenge in that like venture funding has never quite recovered from the, the heights that it achieved in the 2008-ish range, 2006 through 2008. So it is still kind of hard to, to bridge the commercialization valley, especially for new technology companies in the sector. So projects make, get money, you know, I don't think that's a big issue. The cost of capital could come down, but, um, but the money's there. It, it's hard to start a business. I will just add on, on projects raising funds, there was a lot of concern around the time of the tax reform bill getting passed at the end of 2017 that this was going to be a big deal for renewable energy projects. There would no longer be demand from tax equity providers for renewable energy uh, because of the lower tax rate. But we haven't really seen that. Um, so you, if you speak to um, people in the private sector that in, are involved with tax equity deals, they say, yes, well, there may be some companies that now have less appetite for financing individual projects. There are many more companies that are now entering the space, um, partly because of the fact that they are now bringing capital home from abroad. So there was a lot of concern about the tax deal and how that might impact financing, and we haven't really seen a, a big impact um, on, the, on the market for that. Let me invite anybody who would like to ask a question up uh, to the microphone. Um, and, and while you're doing that, uh, let me ask about a topic we haven't talked much about, which uh, we talked a little bit, but uh, it's about um, distributed renewables and energy access. I guess you spoke a little bit about this in, in India, Johannes, but this is also a big issue in, in Africa. Um, do you think renewables are going to be providing um, you know, big increments of energy access in, in both places? So I think uh, in Africa there is certainly uh, much more dynamism and uh, enthusiasm for this s simply because the fundamentals are so much better. So Africa doesn't have uh, a kind of a regional electric grid, uh, individual countries. Many countries only have a grid that reaches sort of barely beyond the major urban centers. So there are plenty of areas with a lot of population uh, that are uh, increasingly able to spend money that just don't have uh, any short-term prospects of uh, getting access to the grid. So I think the opportunity for uh, solar home systems, microgrids, mini-grids is much more significant uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, uh, the IEA did this uh, report uh, called the World Energy Access Outlook. They do these special outlooks to go with their flagship publication. Last, and last year it was on energy access. And one of the things they said there is that in their kind of baseline scenario, 50% of the new energy access in terms of electricity connections will come from uh, distributed uh, renewables. And almost all of that was in Africa because they, as they 
predict, and I would agree with them, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, we won't have an electrification problem in 10 years. It's, it's going to be a fairly marginal issue. Whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa, in 2030, we are going to have more people without electricity than today. Because even though the rates are increasing, they are not increasing as fast as the population is growing. So that market is certainly going to be there. And when you combine that with things like mobile money being a really big deal in East Africa today, there's a lot of opportunity there. And we are now starting, speaking of corporate capital, finally in the past one or two years, we are starting to see $100 million plus investments in these energy access companies. Three, four years ago, if you got $5 million from the, private, uh, from the corporate investment, that was a big thing. Today, we see companies like MCOPA uh, announcing $100 million deals. I would just add on to that um, as an indicator of the growth of the sector that for the first time we actually saw an acquisition of an off-grid solar company. So in October 2017, Engie, the French conglomerate, they had made through their corporate impact fund a small seed investment in Phoenix International, which is an off-grid. Uh, I think they're US-based actually, but they are focused on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. They, they had made, NG had made a number of impact investments through their corporate venture fund, corporate impact fund into off-grid companies. But for the first time, they actually made a full-on acquisition. So NG's Afri Africa business unit bought Phoenix International. And it, it was the first example of an exit for any VC investors in the off-grid space. And it really showed just, uh, you know, obviously for NG, which is a huge company, it is a small amount of their overall portfolio, but it did provide an indication of how serious they are about the sector and how they, it is going to be a growing part of, of their strategy. So that was an interesting development that we saw this past fall. Again, invite anybody from the audience who wants to ask a question to, to uh, please come up and do it. And, and, and while you do that, I mean, Seth, well, we have some people coming up very quickly. I'll, I'll hold my question. And please identify yourself. Sure. Um, Jonathan Ratner, Grid Alternatives. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum from um, distributed energy, I was wondering if uh, the professor could comment on um, the globalized grid uh, initiative that is being uh, driven by China. I mean, to what extent do you think it has any potential legs, and how do you see it relating to their renewable energy policy? So um, here I, I have to be a little bit skeptical. I think this is going to be a, a long way uh, uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, countries uh, that I know, uh, certainly around China, seem very jealous in, in protecting their own grids. Uh, there's a lot of politics involved. Most countries still don't have a power sector that's driven by any kind of market logic. It's driven by political control. And even those countries that do have this sort of more, you know, uh, market-oriented, uh, efficiency-focused uh, grids like uh, the small city-state Singapore, they are actually very jealously protecting their own grids because they're worried that if they link with Malaysia, then they have to deal with problems in Malaysia. So my guess is that this global grid is it's going to take a lot of uh, political bargaining and, uh, uh, and, and those issues are, it's going to take a long time, let me put it that way. Um, any thoughts about the, the the technology and sort of physics of it? I mean, whether or not it's it, you know it's in the near future. I mean, the kind of ultra high voltage transmission that would be required. So, so I, I think uh, on technology, I probably have to uh, defer to my uh, fellow panelists. Uh, uh, but I would imagine, based on what I've seen, that technology is, is much less of a concern than the, the regulatory and, and political issues, that mm -hmm. if it's going to get stuck, it's because of political disagreement rather than uh, technology. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, I, I uh, participated and spoke at a conference on exactly this topic in Beijing two weeks ago and said basically what Johannes just said. Um, so I, I completely agree. I think the, and I, I did some research on this and I, I've been looking at this for a while. Um, I'm not an uh, engineer, but, but from the engineers and others I've talked to, the message I've gotten is that the basic technology of doing high voltage transmission is, is pretty well known. I mean, China has a lot of, you know, 1,000 kilovolt HVDC lines, even bigger actually, um, and that's connecting power from the west to the east. Um, and, and some technologists I spoke to said they thought that that could probably be increased with minimal line loss and even do underwater cables with some type of material innovation. Um, but 
as Johannes just said, the major barriers in this area are political and institutional. Um, and the willingness of countries to interconnect and rely upon other countries for electricity is subject to a lot of questions. Right. So, so all we need is a world government. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, this is also a grid question. My name is Nancy Anderson. I'm the director of the Salon Foundation here in New York City. Uh, seven or eight years ago, there was a lot of talk about the need for creating a smart grid who can be able to bring lots of solar and wind and other, other clean but, but uh, intermittent forms of energy onto the transmission system. We need to get past the 20th century dopey grid and create a 21st century smart grid. And I was wondering if any of the speakers could shed some light on if progress is being made in, in any regions on creating a smart grid. So I think it has largely happened. I think we stopped talking about smart grid. Um, which is the best thing that ever happened to smart grid. <laughs> we started calling it things like grid modernization, grid edge technology, and then now we have this whole basket of additional intermittent flexibility issues. But the things that we were talking about, so smart grid received a big investment in the stimulus package, right? That was mm -hmm. where a lot of that funding came from. And you know, the big areas that we were supposed to build out as a result of that, smart meters, more than 50% of residential customers in the US now have smart meters, and that number is increasing year over year. So we're getting there in terms of smart meters. That's a, that's a foundational element of a smart grid. You absolutely need that. And we're starting to get to the next generation of, of meters as well. And then a lot of intelligence and sensoring and communications on the distribution network. Um, that stuff is getting better as well. And you can see impacts from it all over the place. But one good example of it would be Florida, um, where you can compare the restoration time and pace that it took Florida Power and Light to recover from about an equally sized hurricane a decade ago to what they did in 2017. And the 2017 response time was about an order of magnitude faster. And that's because largely of smart grid technology investments that FPL made during the interim years. So, um, you know, we're not done and the grid can continue to get smarter. But if you looked at it from the perspective of when we, when smart grid was really hot in like 2005, what we wanted to do, I think we've done a lot of it. Okay, that's good news. The only thing I would add is, uh, um, I think this does speak again to these capacity and institutional issues that uh, countries like India still have a very long way to go here. And uh, the, the institutional management of these issues in a heavily politicized system uh, where political decisions drive, for example, pricing of electricity is going to be more challenging. So I would agree that it would be great if in India there was also this sort of sudden uh, disappearance of any kind of smart grid discussion and it would just get done kind of under the radar uh, by the bureaucrats. I think it's unlikely that it would happen, but sometimes that is really the best way to, to get stuff done. Yes, sir. Uh, Gabriel Avgerinos, Energy Mentors. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to frame the question in terms of renewables from a point of view of carbon content and carbon price. So the first question is, how close are we getting to have a rational carbon price? And by rational, I mean something that would differentiate significantly the advantages of renewables versus fossil fuels. And that, in my estimate, would be something around $40 per ton and higher, not at 5, 10, 14, 15. And there's a few countries that have done that already, and they have it as high as 100 or $150 a ton. Singapore is one of them and a few others. But how close are we to get the developing world, at least Europe and the US, to get to that point, number one? And number two, are you aware of any connections that we finally have made in terms of healthcare costs that are caused by fossil fuels, specifically coal particulates, the studies, the health studies have been completed. There are longevity studies that have been completed in China over 10 year periods that show that shaves off somewhere between seven, 10 years life of coal workers and people who live close to the coal power plants. But to my knowledge, there's no study that's connected the total economics, if you will, the delivered energy, including healthcare costs that are huge by comparison to some of the other things. Thank you. <laughs> 
So um, on the on the question of carbon pricing, I do think the situation, uh, the outlook is a lot brighter today than it would have been just a few years ago. So if you look at these different surveys and mappings of carbon pricing initiatives, there's a lot more happening right now than than just a, just a while back. I think the challenge is that it's a kind of a patchwork of carbon pricing in this city, a little bit in that state, something in that county. Uh, I think there are very few countries that have a sort of close to actually declaring, like you said, something like $40 or $50 or more. Um, I'm myself loosely involved in a kind of an initiative to try to pilot carbon pricing in the Nordic countries. But interestingly, we face a challenge there is that because carbon pricing is a kind of a tax, it means that the EU authorities get involved and they are very hesitant to let us do what we would like to do. Um, on the, on the issue of public health, I think this is a, has been a very important discussion. So uh, if you look at why we have a uh, discussion of coal, for example, in East Asia or Southeast Asia, I think the air pollution issue and the public health consequences have been significant. I'm not sure if I've seen too many studies that sort of try to turn the uh, life expectancy losses and premature deaths into, into dollars or yens or yuans or whatever it is, but I think we are pretty close to, to having that conversation, and certainly here at Columbia we have a lot of expertise uh, on this. So uh, I think there's every reason to believe that in the coming years that discussion is just going to get more uh, intensive and uh, we will see better studies and more prominent uh, discussion. I would just add uh, that while I agree on a global level, we might be in a better position for carbon pricing. With the U.S., we're obviously not. Um, and, and even in the, the instances where we do have some progress, such as Virginia stating that they're going to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative to put a carbon price on their power plants, um, to, be, to be quite blunt, Reggie is basically a joke in so far as it actually induces additional uh, reduction of, of carbon emissions. So while it's a great signal and might perhaps lead to some retirements of coal-fired power plants because it indicates that the state of Virginia cares. Uh, it, it, Reggie itself, that carbon price is not enough to actually induce any change. Not to get into more east-west rivalry, but how about California's carbon program? That's also not high enough. Yeah. Sir. No, thank you. Uh, Robin Shoemaker, um, an energy investor, principally oil and gas, but also renewable. Uh, I noticed earlier this week that Apple announced that all of their facilities globally are now powered by renewable energy. And uh, I wonder if, uh, I don't know whether that's an isolated instant, instance or part of a trend among Fortune 500 companies. Maybe you could shed some light on that. Uh, because the discussion is largely centered around uh, policy initiatives, technologies that lower costs for renewable energy. Uh, but what about something like this as a more or less kind of voluntary uh, source of demand growth? I would love to answer that, if that's OK. Please. Um, so this is something we've been focusing more on at, at my company. And I'm actually going to a conference tomorrow uh, at Goldman Sachs in New Jersey, sponsored by uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute. They've been working with a lot of businesses that are looking to uh, procure clean energy. So Apple is actually the second company to have done this globally. The first was Google. Uh, Google essentially announced in 2017 that they were going to be 100% clean energy globally, um, at least for their primary footprint. Uh, it's a different story when you talk about, you know, the electricity use associated with producing Apple phone, iPhones, for example. Um, but this is absolutely a growing trend, and it is more or less voluntary. You could make the case that there is pressure from, uh, from consumers that use Apple and Google products. Uh, you could also make the case that investors care increasingly about climate change. So certainly, uh, you know, ESG investing has has gotten a lot of has caught a lot of interest, but for long-term investors, they care about climate change just because it is actually a risk to business. So it's about an economic sustainability um, mandate. When it comes to just to go back to corporations, um, there are now 131 large companies globally that have pledged to source 100% of their electricity from clean energy. And they mean to do this by contracting directly with wind and solar, for the most part, the most part wind, then solar, a little bit less on biomass or hydro. 
um, rather than, say, buying renewable energy certificates, which is primarily how they uh, would source clean energy in the past. And just, um, you know, just a couple years ago, this campaign was launched. It's called the RE100, and it grows and grows every month. So it's 131 companies now. Two months ago, it was only about 122, 123, so it's growing rapidly. And these are also companies that are growing. So when you look at what's happening with corporate electricity demand, it is the tech companies that are growing quickly, and it is the tech companies that have all signed up to the RE100. Uh, so there is, there is definitely a trend here, um, I, and I would expect this to continue to grow. And just to add to that, there's an initiative, initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial on this topic, um, pulling to, and the Clean Energy Ministerial is a meeting that happens every year of the energy ministers around the world talking about clean energy, and they have a, a variety of initiatives, and, and there's one on corporate purchasing of renewables, which is, I think, helped to move this forward, and if you go to their website, there's good information on it there. Uh, Jean Fox, I do a capstone workshop here for Bloomberg Blue Energy Finance, and uh, former president of the New Jersey Utility Commission. Two questions. One is value of solar, value of DER, which is what New York is doing. Is it workable? What's it doing around the country? I mean, what, who has the best model for that? Because New Jersey is thinking about it. And secondly, uh, the role of utilities in, uh, in this integration of, of renewables into the grid. And should they be, I mean, should they be doing it themselves and rate basing it? Or should it be other people do it and they just hook it all together and have to figure out another way of making their money? And I would just, before you, before you answer, say that if we'd known Jean was going to show up, we would have invited her up here to the panel. So you know, th thank you very much for joining us, and she's really been a distinguished leader in this area for, for many years. Let's see. So the first question was on the value of solar questions. Um, I think that what happened was there was, first there was a wave, right? We, we started with net metering, right? We had net metering in, in most states in the U.S. That was driving most of the distributed solar installations. And there was a backlash against net metering. Um, so utilities started trying to find ways to pull back on that. They were proposing increased fixed charges on the bills. They are proposing killing net metering. Generally didn't work for them. Regulators knocked them back. Um, so then where they started to find an area of compromise for a while was on this idea that you would come up with a value of solar tariff that was specific to solar and would reflect the value that that solar held, right? So Minnesota had that. Austin Energy did that. A few places. That has sort of, folks have fallen out of love with that as well for, I think, a couple of reasons. One you end up just bogged down in a debate over what the value of solar is. And it's also very solar specific, right? And so the places like New York is not doing a value of solar tariff. It is a value of distributed energy. And, and New York's, in theory, again, to the, the challenges New York has had and the REV initiative has slowed this down, but New York's notion of it, which is the LMP plus D, the, the locational marginal price, plus some value of the distributed nature of the technology, which is, a again, a locational consideration, I think that's the right place to end up. It is challenging to calculate, and it's locational, and it requires grid mapping, and that requires data sharing, and so, you know, you run into lots of issues. But, but to me, that seems like the right ultimate solution, and it's, it's not dissimilar from what California is trying to do as well. I think where Minnesota is going to end up landing, and, and there's lots of other states that are, that are looking at it. Do you want to try to tackle the utility business model question? That's a big question. So if I understood correctly, Gina Azu, who should own? Who should own? Who should integrate? Who should integrate? Who should integrate? Right. Um, it is a difficult question to answer. Certainly, there's just so many regulatory environments across and within states that it, it's hard to make a, a general suggestion as to what would be the appropriate business model here. Um, and I, I'm not even sure how to begin answering it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I think you certainly see in, in California that there is a lot of interest in trying to rate base, obviously, as much as you can. Um, certainly, as the utilities in California are losing large sources of load to uh, a very particular California issue, which is kind of wonky. If you're involved in the market there, it's called community choice aggregation. So uh, 
to the extent that the utilities can rate base anything, they're going to be all over it. But the Public Utilities Commission, you know, very questionable as to what they'll let them do. Um, I, I, I'm really, I don't know what to tell you. I, Good. Oh, well, I, I would add to that. So I think you've got, um, you got a couple of options, right? If you're a regulator and you have full authority and you can make all the decisions. Right now, your regulatory construct is such that utilities are incentivized to rate base as much as they can. So your job, so they're gonna try to rate base as many things as they can. They're going to recognize what the grid needs, so it's gonna be flexibility and it's gonna be a bunch of grid modernization stuff. And your job as the regulators to decide what things are appropriate for them to rate base and what things the, the third parties should own. Um, and that's a challenge that every regulator is totally used to facing. The, the harder challenge is that sort of seems like in this new paradigm wherein utilities might need to procure services, for example. They might wanna procure something that is not a, a physical asset that would be CapEx that they could rate base. Um, how do you incent them to do that, right? If it is the economic thing to do, if it is the clean thing to do, whatever your objectives are. And so then you get into the world of performance-based rate making and all the different models that change the utility business model to make it such that it is to their benefit to do all those kinds of things. And there's various versions of it, non-wires alternatives projects, and the Rio model in the UK, and you know, it's in California, they talked a bit about um, allowing utilities to earn a regulated rate of return on the procurement of services that's similar to what New York has tried to do in REV. I, I don't know which of those is the right model, but I think testing out, at least on a pilot basis, um, ways to show utilities that they can generate earnings from something other than putting CapEx in the ground is headed in the right direction. So my uh, comment on this, uh, uh, I would agree with you what you said just uh, last, that uh, the utilities have been kind of archaic in this. In fact, they've been actively opposing many of these efforts to uh, move into a more flexible uh, system. So I think the utilities need a little bit of push and help from other stakeholders. There are some uh, examples of, uh, in Europe, uh, in Nordic countries, Fortum, for example, has decided to embrace this and most of their future business plans are based on very different concepts than what the traditional uh, utility would do. But mostly, if you look at globally, the utilities have been more a problem and an obstacle rather than a constructive uh, participant in this discussion. Well, I would I would say that European utilities writ large, especially the larger ones, have transformed dramatically. The NGs, which was mentioned before, and NL and Eon and EDF and all these companies. I don't know why they all start with an E. They they've made a pretty dramatic business transformation or, that is still underway today, and it's partially because their business was disrupted already. You know, they're generators. They've been mothballing and writing off billions of dollars of assets. We haven't seen that happen yet in the U.S. so much. So. Um, there hasn't been the disruption-driven transformation among utilities, so it's just the proactive ones that are doing it themselves, except in the cases when regulators enforce it upon them. Well, this could be a great topic for a whole other panel, so maybe we'll, we'll do that. Um, and, and in wrapping up, let me say we actually have some other great public events coming up here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Next week, um, on April 19th, we have our annual Energy Summit with an incredible lineup of speakers, actually. Highly recommend it's the afternoon over at the Lowe Library. We have the U.S. Deputy Secretary of Energy. We have the um, CEO of, uh, of SunPower, uh, CEO of ConocoPhillips. Um, numbers of other distinguished speakers are going to be here. And then on April 30th at 5 o'clock, uh, we have a session on conservative prescriptions to climate change with speakers uh, discussing that topic from... Um, a conservative perspective. Um, this has been a great session. Thank you very much. My name is David Sandalow, and you've been listening um, to Colleen Reagan from um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, to Shale Khan from um, Energy Impact Partners, and uh, we particularly came here to celebrate the launch of uh, and release of a book by Professor Johannes Erpelainen um, from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. His book on renewable energy is available on Amazon.com. Uh, please join me in giving our panelists a big hand.